Welcome to Aberdeen, the third largest city in Scotland. Famous for its lively atmosphere, riveting history, and wealth of stunning architecture. From mighty medieval landmarks like the 16th century Provost Skeen's house, to the mesmerisingly beautiful granite-built Marshall College, which stand on the captivating streets of a city filled with stories wherever you look with everything from a towering statue of William Wallace, Scotland's national hero, to a great church dedicated to Santa Claus himself, and an array of historic waterside lanes which hug the perimeter of the city's busy port, where huge ships depart for remote oil rigs and far-flung islands in the North Sea. All of that and so much more is to come as we take a tour of the sights and streets of Aberdeen on a sunny summer's day. But we begin our walk right at the heart of the city, in an area known as the Castle Gate. Focused around this famous square, the Castle Gate has been at the centre of Aberdeen's history for well over 700 years. As the name suggests, it was here where there once stood Aberdeen Castle a great medieval fortress now consigned to history. In its place, there now stand two famous city landmarks. The Salvation Army Citadel, a towering Victorian-era church, which is actually styled much like a castle in its own right, and just in front of it, Aberdeen's historic Mercat Cross, one of the oldest structures that you'll find in the city today, dating from the year 1686. The Mercat Cross was built as the central feature of Aberdeen's historic marketplace, this square serving as the place where local merchants would set up stalls to sell their wares, not just to fellow Aberdonians, but also a steady flow of international visitors to the city, as Aberdeen developed a strong trading relationship with merchants across the sea in continental Europe. When they arrived, those European merchants found a bustling city filled with local pride. Just here we find a statue dedicated to the Gordon Highlanders, a regiment of the British Army which hailed from Aberdeen. Depicting soldiers from different eras of the regiment's history, the statue stands just a stone's throw from where the Gordon Highlanders' barracks were once located, on Castle Hill, the site of the original Aberdeen Castle, just behind the spot where the Salvation Army Citadel stands now. In all truth, the medieval castle was quite short-lived, built in the late 13th century and destroyed shortly after, having been captured by Robert the Bruce, King of the Scots, who successfully expelled an enemy English garrison during a vicious siege in the year 1308. But while Aberdeen may no longer be home to a great castle, there are plenty more majestic landmarks to marvel at, few more majestic than the great buildings of the city's main street, Aberdeen's famous Granite Mile. As we'll see throughout our walk, many of Aberdeen's grandest landmarks are built from locally quarried granite stone, which have a rather sleek grey colour. And just here we're looking across towards the elegant townhouse, another of the most iconic buildings of Aberdeen, the Granite City. Famed for its soaring clock tower, Aberdeen's townhouse, home to the city council, was built on a grand scale back in 1874, but there's more to it than first meets the eye. It was built in the Victorian era as the city's population began to grow rapidly, and local officials decided that Aberdeen's former townhouse, known as the Toll Booth, didn't meet the needs of the modern city. However, rather than demolishing the old toll booth, which was built more than 400 years ago in 1616, they decided to incorporate it into the design of the new townhouse. And just behind the spectacular Victorian granite facade, which we're looking at here, you'll find the structure of the original 17th century toll booth still standing. Inside, it's home to the Toll Booth Museum home to exhibitions on local history and the fantastically preserved remains of the Toll Booth's 400-year-old jail, making it one of the highlights along the length of Aberdeen's main thoroughfare here, Union Street. Running dead straight for about a mile through the city centre, Union Street was built to relieve the strain caused by the cramped, narrow and hilly streets of medieval Aberdeen. And it was quite the feat of engineering, cutting through hills and bridging deep valleys. 
Later on in our walk, we'll see the obstacles that Union Street came up against, and how its construction nearly bankrupted the city of Aberdeen, during a period of sweeping change and renewal in the city. As we know, Aberdeen's history stretches back hundreds of years, but much of the city that we see today is a product of the 19th, 20th and 21st centuries, a period when Aberdeen's fortunes rose dramatically. First as a major port, where shipbuilding and fishing industries prospered, and later as a hub for Britain's oil industry, this city known as the nation's oil capital. Situated on Scotland's northeast coast, looking towards the oil fields of the North Sea, Aberdeen is also the most remote major city in the UK today. Located some 80 miles from the nearest big city of Inverness, and around 100 miles from the Scottish capital of Edinburgh. Despite this geographic isolation, Aberdeen has long been a vibrant centre of industry and learning, a truth demonstrated in eye-catching fashion by what is surely the city's most beautiful building here, the mesmerising Marshall College. Again built from Aberdeen's distinctive sparkling stone, the Marshall College is actually the second largest granite building in the entire world, and it was built back in the 1830s as the main building of one of what were once two universities in this city. That's right, for centuries Aberdeen was home to a pair of rival universities, the Marshall College based here and the King's College based about a mile to the north of here in an area known as Old Aberdeen. The King's College came first, founded in 1495, and just under a century later, the Marshall College was established in 1593. Bear in mind at this time, Aberdeen, with its two institutes, had the same number of universities as the whole of England, in Oxford and Cambridge. And much like Oxford and Cambridge, Aberdeen's King's and Marshall Colleges were rivals for centuries. But eventually, in the year 1860, the two merged to form what we now know as the University of Aberdeen, one of the most prestigious in Scotland. The grandeur of the Marshall College's main building here leaves no doubts as to the university's acclaim, while just in front of it there stands a statue of perhaps Scotland's most celebrated monarch, Robert the Bruce, the 14th century King of Scots who famously laid siege to Aberdeen Castle to expel the English one of many fatal blows the Scottish King dealt the enemy on his road to victory in the First War of Scottish Independence. Befitting one of Scotland's national heroes, this statue of Robert the Bruce stands proudly before Aberdeen's most beautiful building, a building which may have begun life as the home of the Marshall College, but sadly is no longer used for university business. Since 2009, the City Council have been leasing this famous building from the University to use as part of their headquarters. Meanwhile, the centre of education in this city has shifted decidedly to the medieval streets of Old Aberdeen, which we'll talk more about a little later on. But speaking of medieval Aberdeen, here in the city centre, nestled among the granite and glass buildings of recent decades, there stands one of the most impressive local landmarks of the Middle Ages. This beautiful four-storey stone building is known as Provost Skeen's House, and it was built nearly 500 years ago in 1545. Ever since then, the house has rather remarkably remained largely intact, now home to a museum inside detailing the stories of some of Aberdeen's most famous sons and daughters through the centuries and one of those famous figures was a man named George Skeen, formerly the provost, effectively the chairman of the local council, of Aberdeen. A well-known face in the city, Provost Skeen bought this house in the year 1699, and ever since it's been named after him, though there are plenty more intriguing stories associated with this house. In 1746, Scotland was gripped by the events of the Jacobite Rebellion against the British King George II, and in the final stages of the rebellion, Provost Skeen's house here was used by the King's troops as a base in the weeks before they advanced towards Culloden, just outside Inverness, where of course the Jacobite Rebellion was famously put down. 
Here on the corner of the house, meanwhile, is a rather frightening metal face, known as the Russell Head. It was the brainchild of a local shop owner named George Russell, whose bakery was shut down after complaints from a neighbour. So he took his revenge by carving this grotesque image of his own face, so that his neighbour would have to look him in the eyes for the rest of his days. Not all the likenesses in this part of town are quite so repulsive, though, because here we find a statue of none other than footballing great Dennis Law, born in the Woodside area of Aberdeen back in 1940, and who rose to international stardom as part of the legendary Manchester United Trinity, alongside Sir Bobby Charlton and George Best, while also breaking records in 1962 as the most expensive British footballer for his time, and in 1964 as the first, and to this date only, Scottish player to win the award for European Footballer of the Year, an award we now know as the Ballon d'Or. Dennis Law is one of a long list of famous names to call Aberdeen home, a list that includes everybody from singer Annie Lennox to the famed painter William Dice, who actually studied at the Marshall College just before this new granite building was opened. But as we mentioned, this famous city landmark is now no longer used for university business. After the merger between the Marshall and King's Colleges, many of the teaching departments formerly based here began moving to the quieter surroundings of Old Aberdeen, a beautiful area of the city where medieval chapels and university halls crowd around narrow, cobbled streets, quite different from the grandeur of the modern city centre that we're exploring here. Now, we won't quite have time to visit Old Aberdeen on our tour of the city today, as it's located a good mile north of where we are now, close to the mouth of the River Don, one of two rivers which flank the modern city of Aberdeen on either side. Historically, the area of Old Aberdeen was the main centre of settlement here. In fact, the city's name, Aberdeen, literally refers to that location, meaning the mouth of the River Don. But just a mile south of the Don, you'll find the mouth of another river, the River Dee. And it was around this river mouth that a separate settlement, known as New Aberdeen, grew up later in history, as a centre of fishing and cross-sea trade. Over time, Old and New Aberdeen, for a long time distinct boroughs from one another, merged into one major city. But while university life may have shifted decidedly north toward the banks of the River Don, the city's economic hub went the other way, moving south towards the River Dee, where the development of a major port gave birth to the bustling city centre that we find ourselves exploring right now. Later on, we'll venture down to Aberdeen's busy port, an integral part of the city's economy for centuries. But just here, we find ourselves on Upper Kirkgate, a street whose profile has been largely unchanged since the era of medieval Aberdeen. With the exception of the modern granite buildings and Bonacor shopping centre, you'll notice that Upper Kirkgate gradually winds up and down along the natural hills of central Aberdeen, unlike the major Union Street, built to be as straight and flat as possible in the 19th century. As we mentioned earlier, the building of Union Street was key to relieving Aberdeen's growing pains as its old streets and lanes became ever more cramped. And so to showcase the difference between this naturally undulating medieval street and the more recent main thoroughfare, we'll now make our way towards Union Street. But to get there, we need to make our way through the grounds of St Nicholas's Kirk, known as the Mither Kirk, or Mother Church, of Aberdeen. Home to just under 900 years of recorded history, Aberdeen's Mitherkirk can trace its origins back to the mid-12th century, although the huge church building which we see today is an enlarged version of the original. In fact, this was the largest borough church in all of Scotland in the late medieval era. Surrounding the impressive church building is a rather expansive kirkyard, busy with gravestones and the final resting places of many of Aberdeen's most notable names through the centuries. The vengeful bakery owner George Russell is buried here, as is famous local painter William Dice and the 19th century architect Archibald Simpson, 
who's often credited with many of Aberdeen's most impressive granite buildings, which earned it the nickname of the Granite City. Characteristically, St Nicholas's Kirk here is also built of granite, although only partially. The side of the building that we're walking around here, known as the West Kirk, is actually built of sandstone, and is the older of what were effectively two separate churches in one building. After the Scottish Reformation in the late 16th century, it was decided to split the Kirk in two, to create two separate places of worship, a move that was said to enhance participation in religious services. As we see it today then, the West Kirk dates from a rebuild in the 1750s, and the East Kirk, at the far end of the building, was reconstructed after a fire in the 1870s. But together they form Aberdeen's famous Mitherkirk, dedicated to none other than Saint Nicholas, a man who's often known more widely as Santa Claus. The association here is rather interesting. Alongside his Yuletide persona, St Nicholas is also the patron saint of merchants and sailors, and as such he was chosen as the patron saint of New Aberdeen here, focused around the port. As we mentioned earlier, due to geographic isolation with the rest of Britain, Aberdeen held close trading relationships with merchants across the sea in mainland Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, a nation where St Nicholas is also known as Sinterklaas. It's from the Dutch Sinterklaas that we get the name Santa Claus, a more common moniker in Scotland for the legendary gift giver than Father Christmas, a name which originated south of the border in England. But Christmas chat seems unusual on a summer's day like this, as the sun beats down over this impressive feature of the Kirkyard, a mighty granite screen known as the Smith Screen. It was built back in 1829 as part of the wider redevelopment of the city centre, providing a separation between the tranquil grounds of St Nicholas's Kirkyard and the action of the then newly built Union Street, the famous main thoroughfare which bulldozes its way through the very heart of Aberdeen. Here we can look all the way down Union Street back towards the Castle Gate where we started our walk and we can marvel at just how wide, flat and straight it is compared with many of the city's older streets. Named to mark the union between Great Britain and Ireland in 1801, Union Street, a little quieter than normal today due to roadworks, was an immense feat of early 19th century engineering as part of the wider project to modernise Aberdeen. That being said, it was an expensive endeavour and one which effectively bankrupted the city, as viaducts were built to bridge deep valleys, and rows and rows of houses were bought up to be demolished, making way for the street that exists now. But branching off Union Street even today is a network of older streets, including Belmont Street just here. Recently redeveloped as part of Aberdeen's cultural quarter, Belmont Street is home to a wealth of intriguing spots including the former South Parish Church of 1830 just here, a church which is no longer used for worship and is instead home to a popular city pub. Complete with an eerie interior and some fetching Dracula-themed decor, it's inside what was once one of the city's many impressive granite churches that Abaddonians now down their pints and belt out karaoke tunes on Monday evenings just a stone's throw away from another point of local interest. According to legend, it was down Patagonian court here that Robert the Bruce chased the English after removing them from Aberdeen Castle back in 1308. But today it's said to be so named because boats, some of which came all the way from Patagonia at the very southern tip of South America, used to moor at the bottom of this staircase, which descends down towards the floor of the Denburn Valley which cuts deep through what is now the middle of Aberdeen. Bridging the Denburn Valley, known locally as the Den, was one of the main engineering challenges during the construction of Union Street. But for a long time, the valley served as a symbolic frontier between the heart of New Aberdeen and the countryside beyond. That was until the city began to grow in size around the late 18th century. The beautiful Belmont Street here dates from that period, 
as before the 1780s, this was simply open land used for pasture. Today, however, it's home to an array of eye-catching buildings. Among them, the former Congregational Church of St Nicholas here, which was built in 1865, but which is now used as a nightclub, as Belmont Street has evolved in recent years as a central part of Aberdeen's famous nightlife. But back when the street was first laid out in the late 18th century, it was developed as a retreat for some of the city's wealthiest citizens from the hustle and bustle of the castle gate, with houses built here overlooking the scenery of the den down below. However, as the speed of development in the city hastened, streets and houses were laid out far beyond the bounds of the den, the valley instead being converted into an elegant green space then known as the Denburn Gardens, and in a few moments we too will wander down to the valley floor to explore what those gardens look like today. For now though we've reached the top of Belmont Street, across the road from which there stand a pair of imposing buildings. Directly in front of us is Aberdeen Art Gallery, the city's acclaimed gallery which opened its doors back in 1885, and just next door to it we find the gates of Robert Gordon's College, one of the city's most prestigious schools. The school is named after Robert Gordon, an Abedonian merchant who made his fortune trading in mainland Europe, and he returned to his home city here to found a school and a university in the mid-18th century. Famously, it was at this school that none other than Lord Byron, the famous romantic poet, was educated in the 1790s. While just outside the school gates, there now stands a statue to one Charles George Gordon, a celebrated general of the British Army who's one of many people from the city to bear the Gordon name. As you'll no doubt know, Scotland is a nation of historic clans, and as we look back across the road towards the famous Triplekirk's Church, one church which split into three back in the mid-19th century, it was in this area of Scotland where Clan Gordon was a leading force. Tracing their origins back to the borderlands between Scotland and England in the medieval era, Clan Gordon rose to become one of Scotland's most powerful clans through time, occupying a vast territory in the Highlands, much of which is now part of Aberdeenshire. Even today, the clan's seat is at the beautiful Abine Castle, just 20 miles upstream along the River Dee from here. And if you're in Aberdeen for long enough, you're almost certain to bump into someone with the surname Gordon, a likely link to this region's historic clan. Gordons of all eras have played a part in shaping the region and city's history, including many who lost their lives while fighting in the world wars of the 20th century. They are among more than 5,000 names commemorated here at Aberdeen's Grand War Memorial which was unveiled back in 1925. Famous for its large granite lion sculpture, the War Memorial stands on the corner of the Cowdray Hall, a large concert hall opened in the same year by King George V, and it's one of a number of impressive structures in this area of town that were designed to encourage a taste for art and music in the city of Aberdeen. The Concert Hall, alongside Aberdeen's Art Gallery, stands on one side of the Denburn Valley, which we can see stretching out before us just here. The valley takes its name from the Den Burn, a small stream which flows through Aberdeen at this point, although now inside an underground culvert beneath the road, which runs alongside a railway line and the grounds of what were once known as the Denburn Gardens. We'll drop down to take a walk around the modern gardens in a second, but standing tall above them on this side of the valley, we find His Majesty's Theatre, a beautiful Edwardian era playhouse that was opened back in 1906. It's a theatre of true splendour both inside and out. Comedian Billy Connolly once described a gig there as like performing inside a wedding cake. A wedding cake with room for an audience of more than 1400 people making it the largest performing arts venue in the northeast of Scotland. Over more than a century of history, a wide variety of plays have graced the stage at His Majesty's Theatre, everything from modern West End and Broadway productions to Shakespearean classics. In fact, speaking of the Bard, his famous play Macbeth 
is based on the tale of the real-life King of Scotland, whose story came to an end when he died in battle at Lumfannon, which is just 25 miles from Aberdeen. Macbeth is of course a world-famous figure of Scottish history, but far from the only one, because here in front of the theatre, there stands a huge statue of none other than William Wallace, one of Scotland's national heroes. Best known for his military genius, and leading an underdog Scottish army to defeating the invading English at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, Wallace also pulled off an unlikely victory close to Aberdeen here, just a few miles down the coast at Dunnotter Castle. Perched on high rocky cliffs overlooking the North Sea, the medieval Dunnotter Castle was renowned as an almost unconquerable fortress. Yet in an offensive of 1297, William Wallace led a siege against the seemingly impregnable castle, which was being held by a force of as many as 4,000 English troops. And remarkably, his siege was a success, as his armies broke down the castle walls and overwhelmed the English. Today, Wallace's statue in Aberdeen stands proudly at the heart of the city, looking down over the Denburn Valley inside which you'll find one of the best open spaces in Aberdeen. Once known as the Denburn Gardens, these are now Union Terrace Gardens, and they provide eye-catching views of the city from down below, as some of the most beautiful buildings from throughout Aberdeen's history rise into the sky above on all sides. Now, Union Terrace Gardens have changed their shape on numerous occasions through history, they began life as landscaped Victorian-era gardens, complete with a bandstand, in 1879. But most recently, the gardens were redeveloped in 2022, and they now play host to one of Aberdeen's most photogenic spots, the Aberdeen Sign, which stands at the foot of the garden's main staircase, beneath the Wallace statue and His Majesty's Theatre. Unveiled in 2023, these big letters originally stood at the castle gate, with Union Street serving as a backdrop. But they were later moved here to Union Terrace Gardens, and they hope to serve as a symbol of Aberdeen's appeal to tourists in the modern day. Indeed, millions of people from all over the world visit Scotland every year, but many seek out the capital of Edinburgh, as well as the highlands around Loch Ness, and the islands of the Inner Hebrides as their main destinations. Aberdeen, on the other side of the country, is a bit more underrated as a tourist destination. But as we've already seen from just under half an hour of exploring the city, there's plenty to see and do here. As we look up towards the buildings of Union Terrace, the street which gives these gardens their current name, not only are the museums and major landmarks of Aberdeen that we've passed by all worth a visit, but the cobbled streets of Old Aberdeen, the centre of the university, is too as is the beautiful countryside which surrounds the city, home to everything from the rugged Cairngorm Mountains to an almost endless collection of historic castles, including Balmoral Castle, for decades a favourite country retreat of the British royal family. All of those destinations, and more, are within easy reach of Aberdeen if you fancy a day trip while you're here. But of course the city centre is full of treats too, and Union Terrace Gardens are a great place to take a rest as you explore Aberdeen. And once you've explored the floor of the sunken gardens and snapped a photo with the Aberdeen sign, take a walk back up to street level and admire this view across the den towards the houses and church spires of Belmont Street on the other side. As we discovered earlier, Belmont Street was originally laid out in the late 18th century as the place for the homes of some of Aberdeen's wealthiest citizens. But as the city continued to expand, in the following century, a new street on the opposite side of the valley was built, that being Union Terrace. Developed around the same time as Union Street, and named for the same reasons, Union Terrace is one of Aberdeen's most splendid streets complete with yet more impressive statues, like this one of Scotland's national poet, Robert Burns. Surprisingly, in his day, Robert Burns wasn't all too keen on the city of Aberdeen. He visited this place in 1787, and he described it simply as a lazy town. 
But that visit came just a couple of decades before almost all of the buildings that we see around us now. As Aberdeen's economy and industry began to boom like never before as the Industrial Revolution reached its peak. As we take in a beautiful view across the lush greenery of the Den from the vantage point of Union Terrace, Aberdeen may have started out life as a pair of rival boroughs on two separate rivers. But over the last 250 years, the city has firmly established itself as one of Scotland's economic powerhouses. For centuries, Aberdeen was home to a modest manufacturing sphere, the city best known for textile and paper production. But as the 18th century rolled around, heavier industry began to take charge. The first step was the growth of Aberdeen's granite industry. More than half of the buildings in the city centre here are made from granite extracted in quarries on the outskirts of Aberdeen. But the stone was also exported far beyond the city's boundaries. To this day, you'll find Aberdonian granite all over the world, everywhere from the pavements of London to skyscrapers in New York City. And most of it was extracted from just one quarry in the suburbs of Aberdeen. That would be the old Rubislaw Quarry, which opened all the way back in 1740 and remained in operation for more than 200 years until it closed in 1971, during which time more than 6 million tonnes of granite were extracted from the earth, leaving behind one of the biggest man-made holes in all of Europe, still visible today in the west end of Aberdeen. But while this may be the granite city, there was more than one string to Aberdeen's industrial bow. Throughout the 19th century, the port here became an especially crucial arm in the city's economy, as Aberdeen became a major hub of shipbuilding. More than 3,000 ships were built here during the period. Simultaneously, fishing, though for centuries already a major industry, stepped up a gear as technology developed, allowing fishermen to venture deeper into the North Sea on modern trawler boats, and bring back huge quantities of fish. In fact, by the late Victorian era, Aberdeen was Scotland's leading white fish port. All of this industry brought great wealth to the city, allowing it to modernise and build grand new landmarks like the building we see just across the street here, Aberdeen's famous music hall. It was originally built as the city assembly rooms back in 1820, but later developed as a major entertainment venue, hosting everything from rock concerts to opera and more. But the venue is probably best known as the host of the traditional Freedom of the City Ceremonies, a local ceremony which has a history dating back to the very beginnings of Aberdeen in the 12th century. Back then, the Freedom of the City came with it a right to trade in Aberdeen, but today it's purely honorific, having been awarded to a wide range of famous names, from local legends including Dennis Law to Glasgow-born Sir Alex Ferguson the manager who took Aberdeen Football Club to three league titles, four Scottish Cups and two European trophies in the early 1980s, including a famous extra-time victory over Real Madrid. Just across the road, meanwhile, we're passing by the old Caledonian Hotel, historically one of Aberdeen's most luxurious hotels, which opened back in 1892, as the city's industry was at the top of its game. But this economic prosperity didn't come without its ups and downs. After all, we know that the city was effectively bankrupted by the construction of Union Street here. And it's at this point that we reach what was almost certainly one of the most expensive parts of the famous project. Designed to relieve the fast-growing city centre of the strain caused by its historically hilly and cramped streets and lanes, Union Street had to iron out all of the obstacles of Aberdeen's geography if it was going to work. But that of course included the Denburn Valley. The solution was this, Union Bridge, which was built over the valley over the course of four years, between 1801 and 1805, finally linking the castle gate with the west of Aberdeen. Having stood on the valley floor just a few minutes ago, we know how wide and deep the den is, and so Union Bridge had to be a groundbreaking feat of engineering to get all the way across. Today complete with a delightful line of decorative cast-iron leopards, known locally as Kelly's Cats, 
Union Bridge was built to stand 50 feet above the floor of the den and run for 130 feet from one side of the valley to the other. That makes it, to this day, the largest single-span granite bridge in the whole world, crossing a valley that was technically difficult to bridge and eye-wateringly expensive too, costing the city £13,000, equivalent to £1.4 million in today's money. Of course, that, as we cross back onto the other side of the den, was just one part of the Union Street construction project, so it's no wonder that the city's finances suffered so greatly as a result. But fortunately, the impact was fairly short-lived, as Aberdeen's shipbuilding and fishing industries, among others, continued to grow throughout the 19th century, recouping the losses of this mighty street which in the end has proved essential in the growth of the city into its current shape, the largest urban area outside of Scotland's central belt. And it's a city which continues to grow even to this day, because while traditional industries have subsided, Aberdeen's fortunes have continued to rise on the back of the oil industry, a vital part of the city today, which we'll talk more about a little later on. For now, though, it's time to make our way off Union Street and down into Aberdeen's historic Merchant Quarter, which we'll find at the bottom of this huge staircase, known as Backwind Stairs. As we walk down, look to the left and note some old stonework. That was part of an old medieval house, known as Aedes House, which once stood where these steps are today. It was demolished in 1922 to make way for Backwind Stairs, which were built in order to restore a direct link between the Mitherkirk up the hill and an important area of Aberdeen known as the Green. Immediately at the bottom of Backwine Stairs, there stands a pub known as the Old King's Highway, an inn which claims to be the oldest in all of Aberdeen, established nearly 300 years ago in 1741. It's one of a number of pubs, bars and cafes that you'll find in what's now known as Aberdeen's Merchant Quarter, an area of the city focused around the green just here. Now, in all truth, this is much more granite than green today, but this point in the city takes its name from a once grassy area that may have been the centre of Aberdeen long before the city was even born. The Aberdeen we know today may be around 900 years old, but people have lived here, at the mouth of the River Dee, for much, much longer. In fact, the green here may have been the place where prehistoric peoples lived as many as 8,000 years ago, and crafted tools for hunting and fishing out of flint. Not much else is known about prehistoric Aberdeen, but by the Middle Ages, the green remained the central point of the settlement, thanks largely to its proximity to the river mouth and harbour the lifeblood of Aberdeen for so much of its history. In the 13th century, monasteries were established around the Green, and monks engaged with traders at the natural harbour on the River Dee, at the very beginning of Aberdeen's long road to becoming one of Scotland's most active trading ports. As we mentioned at the beginning of our walk, the Castle Gate grew to be the centre of Aberdeen's markets with local traders selling not just to fellow citizens, but also a steady flow of international merchants who had come to Aberdeen from across the sea in continental Europe. Geographically isolated from the rest of Britain, Aberdeen's most direct links with other markets were across the sea, and throughout the centuries, Aberdonians voyaged across to the Hanseatic ports of Hamburg, Bremen, Danzig and more on the North and Baltic Seas, bringing back with them not just a wide range of goods, but also new ideas that were out of reach for other parts of Britain. It's for this reason that Aberdeen has long prided itself as a centre of cultural exchange and innovation. Through the centuries, this city has pioneered everything from the world's first full-body MRI scanner to Scotland's very first all-seated football stadium as well as one of Aberdeen's most widespread claims to fame, self-sealing envelopes, the kind that you don't have to lick to close, were invented here back in the 1890s. There's plenty more to Aberdeen's historic international links which make it a thoroughly unique city. But of course as time went on and technology developed, this city, 
once separated from the rest of Britain by mountains and sea, finally gained a stable link with its own country in the form of the railways. The railways first rolled into Aberdeen in 1850, when a station was built close to the banks of the River Dee in the Ferry Hill area of the city. But today, trains arrive and depart into Aberdeen's huge central railway station, which we find just here, beside the recent Union Square development, an excellent shopping centre that's nestled between the railway tracks and the city's main harbour. The shops and restaurants of Union Square, opened in 2009, are a great reason for people in surrounding towns to visit the big city of Aberdeen. But the railway station serves far more than just those in the nearby countryside. Trains depart throughout the day from here to Glasgow and Edinburgh, as well as a couple which go all the way down to London, a seven and a half hour journey along the length of Britain. But if you think that's a long train ride, it's nothing compared to Aberdeen's most famous railway service. At just after eight o'clock in the morning, a train departs from Aberdeen station here and sets out towards the town of Penzance, close to the tip of Cornwall in the very southwest of Britain. It's an epic 13 and a half hour journey that covers more than 700 miles and stops at 45 stations along the way. Unsurprisingly then, it's the longest scheduled train journey in the UK today, and an extremely scenic way to take in all the views that the country has to offer in just one day. If you're coming the other way from Penzance, you might roll off the train and immediately make for the station hotel here, which dates from 1890. But fortunately, marathon train journeys aren't the only way to reach Aberdeen if you're coming from afar. Just to the northwest of the city is Aberdeen International Airport, one of the country's busiest airports. Like many others around Britain, Aberdeen's airport serves to take passengers to a wide array of overseas destinations, everywhere from the Mediterranean to the Norwegian coast. But it's also the destination for many domestic flights, which are a popular way to reach this city instead of lengthy train rides. Flights to Aberdeen arrive and depart from major cities all over the UK, including London, Manchester, Belfast, Birmingham and more. However, in recent decades, the airport has become busier not with planes, but with helicopters, which are used to transport people from Aberdeen here to remote oil rigs in the middle of the North Sea. After all, Aberdeen is Britain's oil capital. And because of this, the airport here actually holds the title of the world's busiest heliport, an indication of just how much the oil industry is booming in this city. Oil was discovered in the North Sea off Aberdeen in 1969, and since then it's formed a core part of the city's economy, replacing historic shipbuilding and fishing as a leading local industry. Helicopters may provide a quick link for a few people to reach remote offshore oil rigs as far as 200 miles away. But the main connections are provided by ships, ships which typically depart the city from the modern harbour, which we find just here. Situated close to the mouth of the River Dee, where the port's story began, Aberdeen's harbour has been in operation for just under 900 years, since 1136, which some say makes it the oldest operating business in Britain today. Of course, things look very different at the harbour today, as huge ships pack tightly between the piers and quays built on reclaimed land. And while many are indeed closely associated with the city's oil industry, you'll also find a variety of huge freight vessels and even passenger ferries. Aberdeen's harbour here, serving as the main gateway for people travelling to the Orkney and Shetland Islands, the most northerly islands in Scotland. But crowding around the vast modern harbour is a small network of streets which tell us of its past. And just here we find the gorgeous Ship Row, one of the oldest streets in Aberdeen, dating all the way back to the year 1281. Decorated with some beautifully colourful umbrellas, Ship Row is now home to a couple of pubs and bars. But once upon a time, it was the main entrance to the borough of New Aberdeen, linking the harbour with the markets up at the Castle Gate. For that reason, local business owners packed tightly around the street's path, 
hoping to deal with all of the merchants that came into the city from overseas. The buildings that we're passing between now are a collection of granite warehouses and port buildings, mostly of the 19th century. Although among the stonework of a number of addresses along this street, you may stumble across some much older remains of the city's medieval warehouses, some as old as the 14th century. Just up here on the left, meanwhile, there stands the former Trinity Congregational Church, a late 19th century church which now forms part of Aberdeen's popular Maritime Museum, rightfully placed just a stone's throw from the harbour. On that theme, in front of the church, there also stands this sculpture of 2018, Aberdeen's Fishing Industry Memorial, which serves to recognise the men and women who've worked in the city's fishing industry through the centuries, often contending with harsh and at times life-threatening conditions while working out at sea. As we mentioned earlier, Aberdeen was Scotland's leading white fish port towards the end of the Victorian era. But the industry had been present here for almost as long as Aberdeen has existed. Though for most of history, local fishing was focused mainly on river and salmon fishing. And it was only in the 19th century that deep sea fishing, as well as whaling, became a major part of the city's economy. That's one of many stories told inside the city's maritime museum. But just next door to it, there stands another of Aberdeen's oldest buildings, Provost Ross's house, which was built all the way back in 1593. Slightly smaller and younger than Provost Skeen's house, which we saw earlier, this house was named after yet another Provost of Aberdeen, John Ross, who lived here in the early years of the 18th century. Today the house is part of the Maritime Museum, but it serves as a vivid reminder of what Shiprow here looked like back in the period when it served as the main entrance to Aberdeen, for those climbing the hill from the harbour up to the castle gate. And here we can once again see the grand tower of Aberdeen Townhouse soaring above the buildings of the castle gate. The place where we began our walk more than 45 minutes ago, and the place where we'll reach its end in just a couple of minutes time. But of course we now know just how this central part of modern Aberdeen functioned back in the days when it was home to a bustling market and even a great castle, closely linked with the harbour which stood just a few steps away. Over time, the centre of activity in Aberdeen has indeed spread outwards as Union Street helped the city to expand beyond its historic geographic boundaries. And so we now have great city landmarks like the mighty townhouse, complete with that distinctive, often sparkling silver granite look, standing as symbols of all that Aberdeen has been through in its history. Those ups and downs have forged a prosperous modern city filled with local pride. And it's a pride that extends to every corner of Aberdeen, from its most recognisable landmarks to some of the hidden gems that we've found on the city streets. Whether that be the frightening Russell Head, Kelly's Cats on Union Bridge, or even a small old well just here in the heart of the castle gate. This is known as the Manny Well, a historic piece of Aberdeen that was built more than 300 years ago in 1708. Topped by a much-loved local sculpture of the Manny, uncharacteristically made of lead rather than local granite, throughout history this well has been on just as much of a tour of Aberdeen as we have today. In the past it stood at the other side of the castle gate, on the green, and here in the shadow of the townhouse. At this point the road is known not as Union Street but rather Castle Street an older thoroughfare that once provided a direct approach to the gates of the medieval Aberdeen Castle. And standing either side of the road, you'll find famous local pubs, including Old Blackfriars just here. Another of the city's oldest taverns, Old Blackfriars, takes its name from the fact that a monastery, known as Blackfriars, once stood roughly on the same spot, just beside the heart of the action in Aberdeen where the castle overlooked the square, where not just markets took place, but also gruesome public executions for those who'd been locked up inside the old toll booth. That is one of countless more stories to be discovered on a visit to Aberdeen, a city that we've barely just scratched the surface of, despite having walked its streets for nearly 50 minutes now. But sadly, having returned to the castle gate where we began our walk, it's here that our tour of Aberdeen has reached its end. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you're now looking forward to making your own trip to the great granite city of Aberdeen sometime soon.